Things First is sponsored by Gillette, the best a man can get. Welcome into First Things First. Good morning to you. I am Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. That is Nick Wright. We are back from a couple days in D.C. Great little uh, all-star MLB all-star action. And we came back to big, big NBA news. It looks like Kawhi Leonard is heading to the Toronto Raptors. We'll get to what that means for the Lakers, what it means for the Spurs guys. But we'll start with some details of the reported deal According to Adrian Wojnarowski, San Antonio and Toronto are finalizing a trade to swap Kawhi for DeMar DeRozan this morning. But just to complicate things, Chris Haynes is reporting something CeCe's been saying all along. Kawhi has zero desire to play in Toronto. So, Chris, what do you make of all this that is going down today? Looks like it's happening as we speak. Uh, there was always the potential he could be traded somewhere where he didn't want to go. Um, San Antonio, from the beginning, said that they prefer to trade him to the east compared to trading him to the west. That was at the beginning. And then we heard San Antonio say, you know, we're going to try to make a good deal. It might be in the west, might be in the east. They didn't say it had to be east or west. But knowing in the business, no one, especially with San Antonio's success, with Greg Popovich's success, who in the west, you know, is he trying to make better? He's going to be coaching two more seasons. He's coaching USA Basketball. This is his swan song. Why would he, a legendary franchise, best probably in basketball, them and the Celtics, the Lakers, why would I help Magic Johnson to, to, to be able to resurrect that team? No, I, I didn't think San Antonio, it wasn't going to be easy, but it was going to be more by default. Either Boston, Philadelphia, and now we have Toronto that got into the mix. So they're trying to fetch a deal for Kawhi. And That's they were, just real quick to add some to that, we, we, they were open to trading, and I guess technically still are because it's not a done deal yet. They were open to trading Kawhi to the Lakers. We know that, but we know what they asked for. They asked for every young player on the roster except for Lonzo Ball and essentially four, four first-round picks, picks. Yeah. <laughs> two outright first-round picks and two pick swaps. So mm -hmm. they, they, they were open to it. But they wanted more than the King's Ransom. They wanted a King's Ransom and future King's Ransoms via the picks. Go ahead. Steve. So it still becomes very, very difficult. Um, I don't think it's a done deal. I know we're reporting on what other people are saying. But trading players and picks is just one aspect of a trade. There's other aspects. The other one being, will he pass a physical? Will a guy show up? So, yeah, they could trade for Kawhi, but what Kawhi is going to do from this point, I've been very consistent as far as the message. He wanted to go to Los Angeles, that being the Clippers and the Lakers. I didn't think any other team, regardless of what type of talent, coaching staff, or where they were, had a chance of landing Kawhi based on the information that I was getting. Here's the thing, though. To, unless Kawhi is willing to do something that we haven't seen an NBA player do in my lifetime, which is essentially sit out two years, one of which where he is ostensibly healthy because the other, the Kawhi Leonard report that I thought we were going to be talking about today was the one from 12 hours ago, not one hour ago, which was that he might show up to USA Basketball Training Camp. Might show up and let people see his level of health publicly, which we hadn't seen since his nine-game stint this being season. He is indeed that, healthy. That he would be able to play. And so... Unless Kawhi would be willing to take the furthest possible, to the furthest possible conclusion, a true nuclear option, he doesn't have much of a say on where he will play next season. All he could do is cool the market by make it very clear, wherever I play next season will have no impact on where I'm playing in two seasons. And he in has two, made that very clear. In two seasons I'm playing in Los Angeles. And that's why it would appear the Celtics and the Sixers, maybe even the Lakers, didn't make their best offer. But it's also why this move, to me, would make sense for Toronto. Toronto was saying, we won 59 games last year and it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. We are going to switch out our best player, who plays the same position as Kawhi Leonard, essentially, is scoring wing, yes. with a better version of our best player. Everything at basketball, Kawhi Leonard is better than DeMar DeRozan. Kawhi Leonard's a better every aspect. Every aspect. Kawhi Leonard's a better mid-range shooter. Yep. He's a far better 
deep shooter, three-point shooter. He's obviously a better defender. Neither one's known as a great playmaker. Like, So you are getting a better version of your best player, and if you're the Raptors and you've never made an NBA Finals in the history of your team, and LeBron James is now gone from the conference, I do understand what I would say. You know what? We trade for Kawhi. Maybe there's the one in a hundred chance he stays. But if he doesn't, we'll go for it this year with arguably the best player in the conference once we get him. And then we get to restart. We're going to have most of our young pieces. My guess is the trade that the Raptors would like to make is Kawhi, OG Anunobi, pardon me, and this year's first round pick. And which first round pick is important? Because this year's first-round pick, they would think, well, that's going to be not a good pick because we're going to have Kawhi Leonard. We're going to be at the top of the conference. Future first-round picks would be more attractive to San Antonio, less attractive for Toronto because after this year, I think they start a rebuild in Toronto if this trade goes through. And what does this mean for San Antonio? What can San Antonio do with a guy like DeMar DeRozan in their lineup? Well, I'm not certain that the trade is going to go through. Um, he's not the type of player that San Antonio's had before. One-dimensional offensive player. Doesn't shoot the three well. Is more of a mid-range, which is kind of almost obsolete, obsolete in the NBA. But with Popovich only being there two more years, they do have an all-star that with LaMarcus Aldridge, it allows them to be competitive. They will be a playoff team. So that's about as much as, as I, far as I can break it down. There's no championship aspiration in San Antonio with DeRozan compared to having Kawhi there. So do you think San Antonio could have gotten a better offer had they shopped this around a little bit more? Because it seems like if Toronto was It's impossible was gonna... to shop it around more. Everyone in the league, everyone in the universe knows about this. All right. And Kawhi's demands held down what the offers would be. So San Antonio is doing the best that they can do with a very, very tough market and a tough player to trade because of his demands. But if San Antonio was putting the message out, then maybe some of the other, I mean, Toronto obviously didn't listen. Toronto was like, okay, we get that. I think we're, Toronto, we're, I think, okay, listen, for I, one I, year. I think we, you have to recognize different incentive structures. And I think you have to recognize that not every team in the NBA is trying to win a championship next year. And that's a critical piece. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, hanging over every NBA conversation we have is the specter of the Golden State Warriors. And if you already thought the Warriors were the most talented team we'd seen, and then they added DeMarcus Cousins, and you are now, you thought you were on the precipice of contending, and then the best team in the league got better. They improved their worst position to arguably the best guy in the league at that position. Maybe you're saying, we can't win a title next year. So why would we give up anything down the road? For Toronto, Toronto, to me, is a very interesting fit, and it's what I brought up last week. That they, The fact that Kawhi... Does this move right here, and even though people would think that, okay, yeah, they might be the best team in the East, but does this give them some type of parachute that if the case they want to rebuild or exactly. blow up the whole team? That's the reason why for Toronto, you sell to your fans, we got better. Yes. We went from 59 wins, and we are still trying to go win. You have the We're, best player in the East. You got the. You, uh, I would say Giannis, but sure. They, they, they will say we have the best player in the East. They certainly have a top two player in the East. We, we are going for it. We're going for it. And then maybe you make your first NBA Finals ever. But whatever happens, then Kawhi leaves. Then all of a sudden, oh, wait, Lowry, Abaka, and Valanciunas will all be on expiring mm -hmm. deals next year. You have Siakam. You have Fred Van Vliet. You're, you have all your own draft picks moving forward. And then you can sell to your fans more easily. Listen, we went for it. We got as far as we went. Mm -hmm. DeRozan's contract is off the books, which I think, given his limitations in today's NBA that C alluded to, is probably a guy you don't want to be paying $30 million a year to. Those guys become expiring deals, and you get to reboot it. So Toronto was a team that Kawhi only playing for a year didn't really scare them. I Listen, I think if this trade goes through, Philly and Boston – there's going to be meetings in the general manager's office. Philly doesn't. The general manager's office empty in right. Philly, but whatever, whoever, whatever office they go to, should we take this a little more seriously? Did we did we miss an opportunity here? If we're Boston, did is the the ten percent chance that Boogie made the Warriors worse? Should we have bet on that? Like, should we have should we have put Jalen Brown out there? Sure. And there'll obviously be conversations in Magic Johnson and Rob Palenka's office. All right. Once again, our top story: the Spurs and the Raptors finalizing a deal that would send Kawhi Leonard to Toronto for De uh, DeMar DeRozan. We'll talk much more about that. But on the other side, we'll talk a little bit of football. A former Patriot is now making more money 
than any current Patriot. That's next on First Things First. All right, new topic. Here we go. Patriots is trading receiver Brandon Cooks to the Rams back in April. We assume the Pats didn't think he was worth the money to keep him. The Rams certainly do. Los Angeles signing Cooks to a five-year, $80 million extension. That'll keep him a Ram through the 2023 season. Cooks coming off three consecutive 1,000-yard receiving seasons. Also played with perhaps the two best quarterbacks of all time, <laughs> with Breeze and Brady. CC, what was your reaction to Cook's deal with the Rams? Uh, not surprised. When the Rams traded for him, he was in the option year. He was already making $8 million. He's a young guy. He's a speed guy. If you can put together in this NFL consecutive 1,000-yard season, if you can put together three or four of them, you're going to get, if you're a start, you're going to get 12 to $15 million a year. The market has been set um, by the wide receivers at the top, so people might look at this deal and be astonished, but no. There's plenty of wide receivers out there making this type of money, and there's a bunch of wide receivers right behind the next year, year and a half, that will be making 18 to potentially $20 million. So I think the Rams did the right thing. You can't look at the, at the length of this contract and the average to really know what it's about. This is really a three-year deal. Most of these deals are three years deals. This is a six year deal for 88 million, about 14, a little less than 15 million a year. So that's what it takes to get a starting number one wide receiver. Even if you don't believe he is a number one, this is the going rate for wide receivers in the marketplace now. And the reason CC calls it a six year 88 million instead of five year 80, as it's being reported as, is it's five years 80 being tacked on to the one year at eight he already has. So it's a five year $80 million extension. Yeah, I would have been happy if they had torn up the last year. That's what I would have done. You got to eat that last year. <laughs> Well, for the, six as years, the player, you six mean. years in pro football, signed a contract for six years. He is never, I can guarantee you, mark my words today, he will not make it to the end of that contract. Right, you're saying not necessarily he won't still be in the league, but that that he will be yes. on either a different team. The contract or, is structured that right the, 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 to where you have an out. That's why when we heard, by the way, the Le'Veon Bell that he was offered five years seventy. It's always about the structure. When, when is the out years for the team essentially? I see's right that we should have seen this coming when you trade a first round pick for a player who's only got one year left on his deal in the NFL, and he's a first rounder, so that that fifth year option is totally different. It's a, it's a high price. Right. It's not like you're just getting a guy in the last year of his contract. You're like, oh, the guy's making 400000 No, the guy's making $8 million. And so they traded away a high-value pick, the 23rd pick of the draft, to get him. Now, I am I a little, if I were the Rams, would I have operated with a little more trepidation than they seem to? Would I have wanted to see him with a quarterback who is not Drew Brees Brees or or Tom Brady? Brady? Like, and see his level of effectiveness? Would I have wanted to see when his biggest skill is basically the nine route, catching the deep ball, and that is what Jared Goff's biggest weakness is? Would that make me a little nervous? The fact that I know Todd Gurley's got to get his money, Aaron Donald's getting his money, you traded also for Marcus Peters. He's ostensibly going to get his money. All those things would make me a little nervous at paying him at this price, but when you trade the first-round pick, that's the price. Like, the, yeah, I mean, you're gonna you're going to extend him. You're not going to trade the 23rd pick of the draft for one year of Brandon Cooks. So I did see it coming. I do think that there are players across the league at his position that love seeing this. And then, of course, there's Le'Veon Bell saying, "You got to be kidding me!" <laughs> like, there's running backs across the league saying, hey, "What is happening?" Where well, the running backs need to be watching the running backs and not watching the wide receivers. You can't watch another position and think that it's going to help you with your contract. It's been that way for years in the NFL. The running backs. They're not nearly as high regarded as the wide receivers, and the money reflects that. And the amount, if you look at the 10 wide receivers that are getting between 17 and 14 million dollars, so he, he, no need to look at Brandon Cook's contract. You can look at all the wide receiver contract. It's a position that would warrant paying more money than any of the running backs. So can I ask you about that? This is the thing I don't understand. Why, when we're evaluating players and their contracts, I understand why quarterbacks have to be in a totally different bucket, so throw them out. But why, when we're evaluating players and contracts, are we just comparing them to guys at their position rather than impact on the game? Because you are, what is, the NFL has said, what you described there is totally accurate. That wide receivers are judged against wide receivers. So, when the top paid wide receiver makes around $17 million a year, that's why a guy like Albert Wilson, 
who played for my favorite team last year, the Kansas City Chiefs, I did not think was an impact guy at, in the least, goes out in free agency and gets $8 million a year, a contract that would make him, as a running back, the top paid running back in the league other than Le'Veon Bell. Who doesn't clearly well, have as big of an impact on his team I would as a argue, guy like Le'Veon Bell. I would argue Brandon Cooks doesn't have nearly as big of an If I heard this offseason, the Patriots, instead of trading Cooks for a first-round pick, traded Cooks for Bell, I'd be like, wow. The Pats got a lot better. Why are the, from offensive skill position players, why are the contracts not looked at by impact? How much, how much added value does he add to your offense? Why does it have to be running backs make what running backs make, wide receivers make what wide receivers make? I don't, I don't get the no, logic I don't, of that. Uh, I don't make the rules. I just play by the rules, all right? And what we've seen with running backs, you have been able to get that productivity from cheaper sources that being you don't have to spend a high draft pick on a running back you can find a running back anywhere in the draft and the league has shown that you can utilize free agents or several guys at the position wide receivers if you want a top flight guy you're going to have to be able to pay for it and the drop off from a top flight wide receiver which, which I believe is critical to your offense compared right. to a top-flight running back and the productivity you can get through other positions and through calling plays, I believe it's easier to replace that productivity than it is from a wide receiver. Is it, hard, is it just too hard to quantify impact on I, a I, team? Well, the, it, I, impact I don't is a variable that no one can give you a definition on. Right, that's what I'm saying. Maybe it's just a difficult way to, to kind of bridge the gap or I, to I blur think the that, lines Listen, I positions. think teams know out there that the, the top running backs in the league are more impactful than a guy like, I don't know, Dante Moncrief, who makes almost $10 million a year. I think guys know that. I think just objectively you know that. C's right that they are. That's not how they're evaluating the position. And the Rams knew when they traded for him they were going to have to give him this type of deal. I do. There's the, the other butterfly effect of this. You know who's in the same draft class as Brandon Cooks? Odell Beckham Jr. You know who also this year is playing on his fifth-year option? Gotcha. Odell Beckham Jr. He's not on his third different team. He's not on his third different quarterback. He's in the same team, same quarterback, and no matter what you think of Brandon Cooks, who's a good player, he is not the caliber of player of Odell. And Cooks got, now, Odell wants a slightly bigger deal than the one Cooks got, but what are we talking about Odell wanting? $18 million a year? And of course. Cook, and Cooks well, just got Well, the highest paid guy's making 17 and a half, 17 million. Yes. And, and so, I mean, and Cooks just got $16 million a year as an extension. So I think while... L. Bell maybe sees this, says, you got to be kidding me. Odell sees this and said, that's awesome. That's a guy from my draft class, at my position, who I'm better than, who just Yeah, I got think there's other guys that Jarvis Landry, if you, if you look at who has come and got signed, all these guys have uh, something that's going to help OBJ. It's just not one guy. You got 10 guys making above 14 million. The, the, I agree. There's a, there's a long precedent, but the point that I'm making is this is the first guy at his position in his draft class. Yeah, but I don't care. I'm trying to get removed from my draft class. I'm trying to be the highest paid guy. I don't, I don't want to be compared to Brandon Cooks and, and Landry. All right? So I don't believe it helps him as much when you're trying to be the top paid because you don't bring those guys up. You only bring up the top guys. You don't want to be compared to Brandon Cooks. Would you not in the negotiation, if they if they had offered you, if the Giants had offered him their last offer was five years, $80 million, would you not bring up Brandon Cooks in this regard? Only now. Like, hold on. You guys you guys just offered me five years, 80. That's just what he got. We know I'm better the than The Giants him. are not going to offer OBJ the same contracts as Brandon Cook. There's no need to have Brandon Cook as a talking point. There's no comparison between the two players besides the time that they came into the league. If I was OBJ, I would, I would move the conversation. This is not about him. This is about Antonio. This is about Julio, who's trying to get a new contract because he's making less than Brandon Cooks now. Mm -hmm. So that's what the conversation should be about, his age and these other guys and what they've accomplished. All right, let's take a break there. On the other side, let's get back to our top story. How much would Kawhi in the East affect the Lakers in the West? That's next. This is First Things First. This Friday on FS1, the Big Three is live from Miami. Catch it all on FS1 at 8 p.m. Eastern or stream it on the Fox Sports app. It's been very fun early season in the Big Three. Catch it this Friday. All right, we're now going viral here on First Things First. Last night, two-time MVP, seven-time All-Star Mike Trout went yard in the All-Star game and enjoyed his overall experience. After the game, he hopped on Twitter, posted a selfie with Yankee slugger Aaron Judge and Red Sox outfielder Mookie Betts. The caption read, quote, always something special, hashtag 
All-Star Game. Thank you for the hospitality. But this is, th sorry to interrupt, Jenna. The coolest part of Trout was finding out Mike Trout and our guy CeCe share a common interest outside of sports. Both budding weathermen in their off time. He was asked about the storm that was coming. Evidently, my, I didn't know it until last night. Did you know this about Mike Trout? Didn't know it. That he's like much like you, a weather enthusiast. He goes on Weather Channel, evidently in the off season sometimes, like yep. on the Weather Channel. And he gave an accurate forecast. Like I think it's going to rain a little bit longer. Uh, I don't think the game's going to stop. I think yep. it's going to yep. storm's going to move. A large mass over the area. I think it will go through. <laughs> yeah. it's a, I had no idea. I didn't know this was a little thing that some elite athletes in their spare time. Meteorology. People are obsessed with the Weather Channel. They mm -hmm. will sit and just watch it like it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. See, you said, See, you, you said you want to. You said you had a communications it. degree from Ohio State. I think you've been lying. Or communications was your focus at Ohio State. Meteorology. I, I think you're lying to us. I think it was meteorology. I think that's where you're. That that's the fork in the road moment for you. When you were leaving school, not leaving school, meteorology could have been where no, you I'm went. No, I'm just, I'm shocked that you guys are shocked that <laughs> I would shocked. have interest in the weather. When I had a job for almost 20 years, that was it was outdoors. outside. That was outdoors? Good point. Fair enough. I, I, I get that part of it. Like, if you were coming to the office and you knew you had to go outside and work out for at least three to four hours, mm -hmm. would you check the weather? Yeah, but yours, but here's the thing. You no longer have that job. You're still, you're checking weather in cities you don't live in. You're checking, you, you, I, it's the number one app on your phone. I know this. You can't act like it was just job related. Deep seated as a child, a young Chris Carter thought one day, he might be, what is it? Who's the, Al Roker? Al Roker. There you go. And said you went and became Chris Carter. I'm just saying, I feel like I know that about you. Mike Trout has that in common. Yes, you and Mike Trout, <laughs> buddy meteorologist. Yeah, that was me, watching the Today Show, trying to be Al Roker. <laughs> that was me. Time for some stories to start your morning, brought to you by the unexpected energy of ExxonMobil. Sticking with the MLB All-Star Game, it looked more like the home run derby. Two teams combining for a record 10 home runs. The American League went on to beat the National League 8-6 in 10 innings. Nick, how exciting was the All-Star game in D.C.? It was a great game. It was, for good or for bad, it was what baseball has been this year. Whole bunch of strikeouts, whole bunch of home runs. There was, what, 13 runs scored in this game? Or 14 runs, 14. 13 of which were via mm -hmm. the long ball. 25 strikeouts between the two sides. It was an exciting game, and much like last regular season it ended with an Astro winning MVP the all-star game ended with that as well yeah a lot like Smoltzy talked about as a guest on our show called the game last night on on Fox this is baseball now young kids it's about launch angle it's about throwing it hard every time that's why you have the gun up there for the pitchers exciting and how far can I hit it it's not a lot of base hits not a lot of doubles not a lot of sacrifice hey move the guy over old school baseball is gone this is what get used to this mm -hmm. the long ball yep all they, right, speaking of all-stars. they say, Jenna, chicks like the long ball. <laughs> chicks That's take the long ball. Yes, we do. <laughs> According to reports, the Orioles have a deal in place for Manny Machado to be traded to the Dodgers. Oh! Machado would be jumping from a team in last place to a team at the top of their division. See, would Machado make the Dodgers World Series contenders? Yeah, well, the Dodgers are going to contend for a World Series even without him. Now, they could use a shortstop. They do have a hole there in their lineup, and they also could use his bat. But when you look at... At the firepower at Houston, you better add someone like him to your lineup. Absolutely. It puts the Dodgers right where they need to be. The Dodgers and the Braves, they are teams probably that have overachieved more in the first half of the season for Major League Baseball than any other teams given the injuries the, that the injuries. Dodgers have. So that's, it's, that's the critical point because the Dodgers have a worse record of the break than you would have thought going mm -hmm. into the season. So you'd say they'd underachieved, but knowing the injuries they had, knowing that Kershaw hadn't been in there, he, they're already contenders. He would make them, to me, the favorites in the NL. All right, let's move on to some football. Entering his 15th season with the Cardinals, Larry Fitzgerald has no intentions of taking his talents elsewhere. Fitzgerald said, quote, if I'm not playing in Arizona, I won't be playing anywhere. Chris, how much do you respect Fitzgerald's loyalty to one team there, the Cardinals? Uh, yeah, he's committed to this area. He does all his charity work um, there has really established himself in the community. The Bidwell family who owned the Cardinals have been very, very good to Larry Fitzgerald. I wouldn't be surprised if Larry was one of the few players that moved from on the playing field to some front office or potential ownership position within the next several years if he didn't get into broadcast. He's a kid who's got a lot of options, and he's got a lot of money. But the relationship with Michael Bidwell, I believe you can hear it in this conversation. He will never 
play for another team, not even his favorite team, the Minnesota Vikings. And listen, this is obviously an all-time great. A couple days ago, I kind of impromptu, you asked me my top five wide receivers ever. And I said, Jerry, Chris, Randy, and T.O. And then I said, there's an argument for who could be fifth on that list. He's in that argument already, whether he stopped playing right now and he's one of the best people in the NFL. I don't think guys have to spend their whole career with one team, obviously, but it's nice occasionally when guys do, and Larry's going to be one of those guys. All right, finally, Randy Gregory is getting a new lease on football life. The NFL reinstated the Cowboys' defensive end Tuesday on a conditional basis. He's allowed to be at camp, but he's not yet clear to practice. He missed 30 of the last 32 games for multiple violations of the league's substance abuse policy. Gregory says the reinstatement is a blessing and he's, quote, a totally different person. CeCe, how happy are you with this decision? I'm very satisfied that he's going to get the opportunity to be able to get a second, third, or fourth um, chance in life. The National Football League, they have worked with Randy and his family to try to get him as healthy as possible. And this is as healthy as he has been since he's entered the NFL from his days of playing football at the University of Nebraska. He was red flagged on a drug test when he came into the league. So he has been an issue with the NFL and his involvement with the drug program since he came in. Um, over the last year, he's been able to stay clean. Um, he was able to spend a substantial amount of time in a facility I'm very, very familiar with in California. Um, I've been in communication with him for a long period of time, him and his family. I'm trying to help him uh, understand some of the things that he would need to as far as substance abuse and alcohol addiction uh, moving forward in his life. And also, um, I can proudly say that I, I watched his recovery um, I did have confidence in his recovery that enough confidence that I would write a letter to the NFL to help support him coming back into the league. I've only written a letter for several players. I've been involved with a lot of players as far as their overall rehab. So this is very, very tough for me because once you go in, this is – this is very hard because if he flunks another test, his career is probably going to be over, but his life won't be over. So I try to attach myself to him to try to help him out, to give him the power to be able to make good decisions that he can have a long and successful life. I really don't care that much about the football. I care more about his life. Is he an asset to a football team? Yes. So I hope, Randy, I hope he continues to make the right decisions. But, man, with addiction, it's 24 hours, man. I hope he has a good day today. If he gets through the day, then he can make it through another day. But that is the real, real struggle. And, um, and he's going through it on a daily basis. He is not out of the woods by no stretch of imagination. Uh, uh, from a football angle, I do have this question, not about his impact on the field, but about the NFL's evolution in this process. Is it fair to say that five, let's say his career, just take everything that happened to him and put it five years in the past or ten years in the past, the failed drug tests, all of that, that his career would have been over? That the NFL has evolved at least somewhat in the ability to give guys. They're trying to. And the collective bargaining agreement has helped them because they've changed the, the language in the collective bargaining agreement around Josh Gordon. When we saw Josh with the, the continued uh, abuse and missing, missing tests and being suspended from the league, that they have kind of dialed it back a little bit. So the players are fine game checks before they're actually suspended. So there's a couple different levels before the public even knows that a guy has a situation. And you got to give a little credit to Jerry Jones and the Cowboys who have stuck with him and wanted to give him chance after chance and now seemingly believing in him and wanting to give him yet another one. Uh, Jerry Jones is one of the best proponents for, for overall mental health and, and wellness and overall as far as addiction, drugs, and alcohol. Jerry Jones for a long, long time. And a lot of that... A lot of reason why the players for Dallas for a long time love Jerry is because Jerry has always taken a personal interest in guys in the ugly stories. Jerry, he, he, he embraces that part, and he has helped so many athletes out that we don't even know about. But Randy couldn't have gotten the help without Jerry. So you got to be able to give Jerry a, a, a lot of credit for Randy and his decision-making. Yeah, we do wish him all the best of luck. All right, back now to our big story this morning. According to Adrian Wojnarowski, the Spurs and the Raptors are finalizing a trade to swap Kawhi Leonard for DeMar DeRozan. The big twist in this one, Kawhi apparently has no interest in playing for Toronto, something CC's been saying for a while now. But let's focus on one of the teams Kawhi wanted to play for. Chris, what does this mean now for the Lakers? 
Um, well, first you have to be able to see if the deal, deal is going to go through. The, assuming it, assuming it does. If Kawhi Leonard is going to play for the Lakers, I believe that he's going to play for the Lakers. No matter when he's going to get there, Toronto. Even if they do trade for him, they can't hold him. All right, he's got one more year left on his contract. He can leave. They can't protect him. There's nothing that they can do. That is the desire of Kawhi Leonard. Now we knew all along that San Antonio could trade him. And you would have a situation where you would have a showdown. And that's what they decide. If they make this trade, that's what you're going to have. Toronto has not talked to Kawhi. All right? So in the process of trying to trade for him, they're going to have to try to convince Kawhi to come to Toronto for one year. Now, everything that I've heard, all my intel up to this moment, would tell me that Kawhi is not, he's not, he's not entertaining one-year deals. Paul George, what it was communicated to me was the Paul George deal is not going to happen. You're not going to rent Kawhi for a year and try to win him over and think that he's going to sign what there. What is the alternative, see, not sitting out? If he doesn't want to entertain Toronto for one year, what, what, is the, what, what options yeah, do you Not showing have? up for his physical and sitting out. Is that on the table? I haven't heard that part. That part we'll have to hear about because now we didn't know that someone would trade for him. But if Kawhi is going to continue on the path that he's on, saying that I only want to play in Los Angeles, that's what he's going to have to do and next. I, and I think he's got a bit of an out in this regard. He Because he, he, we have heard from r repeatedly the Paul George situation is not on the table. And that can be couched as, well... It's not the Paul George situation as far as trading for me and convincing me. I, I, would be, I, I would be dumbfounded if anyone were to trade for Kawhi and Kawhi sits out a season. That would shock me as a sports, as someone that's covered sports my whole life, that's watched the NBA my whole life. That would shock me. So, and I also believe, even though DeMar DeRozan's here on Instagram, he's saying the Raptors came to me and said they wouldn't, they weren't going to trade me at Summer League. The Raptors actually did a press conference yesterday. They said, we meant to say would, not wouldn't. That, that, that's what happened there. Oh, um, but the Raptors said we weren't going to trade him at Summer League. So what they, about the end of the meeting when you shake the guy's hand and say, oh, are we on the same page? I, it's it, tough. It's it's a tough business, man. Yeah, what yeah. I learned from it's both a, of you, it's, business. It's, it's, it's a it's tough business. No, it's, no, that's a flat lie. That's not business. That's just a lie. All right? They're trying to protect themselves. They told him to his face, you're not going to get traded. And they changed their mind. Or they didn't have the guts to tell him. Those are the only two options. Right. And so, so, but for the Lakers, though, because this is where I thought Kawhi was going to go this year. For the Lakers, you can spin a happy face on this. And you can say, okay, as long as we get him next year, we don't now we keep anything. all our guys. Yeah. Now, I've said how I think it's harder for them to bring in a third star if they don't have Kawhi already in the building, if they have to sign Kawhi Leonard in the offseason and bring in somebody else. I also think that you, you don't know how many years you have as LeBron as the best player in the league. You feel like over the course of his contract, he's the whole time going to be one of the best players in the league. And while I don't think it's likely, I saw Kobe Bryant be 26, 6, and 5, one of the best players in the league, and then snap his Achilles, and he went from one of the best players to never being an all-star caliber player again. I don't think that's going to happen. I do know that the Lakers have operated this offseason like they thought they were going to get him. But we don't have to make our best offer yet. We can wait out San Antonio. Because while I would be shocked if Kawhi were to be traded and not report to that team, I wouldn't have been shocked if the Spurs held on to him and Kawhi didn't report back to San Antonio. That I have seen. I have seen a guy say, I'm not playing for this team anymore. And so I think the Lakers thought they had leverage in that regard, especially once you saw the Sixers won't even offer faults. The Celtics won't even offer Jalen Brown. And so if you're Los Angeles, now this is a year, if you don't get, have Kawhi Leonard, where you can't even squint and pretend you can be uh, contending with the with the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, I believe that the demands of San Antonio going to Los Angeles were too high. If you look at the three players that they wanted, the two draft picks and two swaps. So it's, it's not the Lakers' fault. San Antonio came in with high demands. They got good young players. They have draft picks, and they basically wanted them all. So... The Lakers, they can look at it. They, they need to watch and see how Kawhi is going to respond to this to see what they're going to do. But the Lakers, they didn't make a bad move, and Kawhi is still available for them in the future. So 
if this deal goes through, this is the Lakers team as it currently stands yes. heading into if this, this year. If this deal goes through, they're, I mean, they're, they're basically out of cap space except for a taxpayer, except for one of their exceptions. They, they've got guys on one-year deals. They, the, the attractive trade pieces they have are young guys that they didn't even want to get rid of for Kawhi Leonard. So you're not going to trade for a B-level player. Like, it's going to be LeBron and the kids. It's going to be, let's see how good Ingram gets. Let's see how good Kuzma gets. Let's see if what we saw from Josh Hart in Summer League, which was something of a revelation. Let's see how Lonzo responds to the scope he just had. And it's going to be LeBron and the kids. And, I mean, that's... That, that could that's going to be fun to watch. That's going to be interesting. But it's a different team than than a couple months ago when the possibility was there for the, you know, the three guys we thought that could potentially all play together, which was Paul George and Kawhi and LeBron. Now they'll move forward with LeBron. Let's not forget Magic Johnson's words. Have patience. This yeah. free agency is not about one year. All right, we're in this for the long haul, so there's no need to panic. There was, there was a great chance that Kawhi could be traded somewhere else, but his contract status still didn't change. He's going to be a free agent after the season. Okay, let's take a break. Coming up on the other side, more on the Kawhi deal. Are the Raptors making a mistake? That's next on First Things First. Back here on First Things First, we're joined by former NBA head coach Stu Jackson. Stu, good morning. Thanks good for being you, with sir. us. Good to see you. Thanks we got a lot me. to talk about this morning. Just Rumor has it they threw you in. <laughs> in the trade. <laughs> <laughs> you used to be able to play a little bit. They threw you in. Chris, I can't get buckets anymore. Okay, I'm sorry. all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. But there was a death. Let's keep it real here <laughs> yeah. this morning. Uh, let's talk about it. According to Adrian Wojnarowski, San Antonio and Toronto are finalizing a trade to swap Kawhi Leonard for DeMar DeRozan. But don't get too excited. CC's been saying all along Kawhi doesn't want to play in Toronto. It appears, according to his Twitter feed, DeMar DeRozan doesn't really want to play in San Antonio. Uh, both now <laughs> widely being reported. Stu, what would trading for Kawhi, would it be a bad move for the Toronto Raptors? Yeah, I think, I think it's a bad move on a number of fronts. Oh, so number okay. one, I, you, know, you have to look at the situation with DeMar DeRozan. I mean, here's a young man that agreed to go back to Toronto and sign with them long term. So in the eyes of the Toronto franchise and all the players in the league, I think that that's a bad move. But now you're getting Kawhi Leonard, who is unhappy. He's unhappy with his move, as is De DeMar DeRozan. You're basically renting him for one season. It's a large risk for the Toronto Raptors. You get Kawhi Leonard for one year in hopes that you get to the NBA Finals. If you don't, he leaves, he bolts, and I agree with you, Chris, he bolts for L.A., OK, so now uh, on, what's on the other side for Toronto? You're in rebuild mode. So you rent yeah. a player for one year on the other side. You're in a rebuild mode. It's just a bad move and a very high risk, I think, for the Toronto Raptors. Listen, I think the argument about lying to DeMar DeRozan, as is being reported, is what happened. I mean, that's a harsh way of putting it. I think it's if you tell him a few days ago, we're not trading you and now you're in discussions to do exactly that. You, you mislead, deceive, I, I think lie is a fair word to use, and the ripple effect with agents, with players, with guys wanting to come there, that's a legitimate concern. The reason that I disagree with the rebuild part being bad is I think going for it for one year and then rebuilding is a better alternative to what they would have if they stick with the status quo, which is good but not good enough. It, go ahead. No, but, you know, what you're saying is, okay, Kawhi Leonard is going to exponentially be that much better than DeMar DeRozan. Listen, Toronto Raptors have not gotten out of the Eastern Conference for a couple of reasons. One is offensively, they've, you know, they changed themselves last year to a team that was more pass oriented. Yeah, until they, they got to the playoffs. Until they got to the playoffs. So they haven't taken that next step. And until they change the way that they play, and that becomes part of their offensive DNA, they're not going to win the, West, the Eastern Conference. So does Kawhi why Leonard bring that to you? I don't know. I, but you said there, there, you said there's a couple reasons. The other reason the Raptors haven't gotten through the East is because of LeBron James. He's gone now. Right, and like, that's the reason why I believe they're making a mistake. LeBron is gone. The monster's gone. Like, why I want to rebuild my team and the guy that's been destroying us, he's gone to the West. Why don't I stay in intact? Because let's not forget, man, they got a juggernaut in Boston. We see what they got in Philadelphia. You trying to rebuild after the commitment that you said, that whole commitment, the general manager said, we're going to go back to Lowry. We're going to go back to DeRozan. We're going to bring the coach back. 
Man, how long did that last? LeBron crushed that in the series there. So they totally gave up. They got, got rid of the coach. Now they're getting ready to get rid of their star and rebuild in Canada. You know how hard it is to, for them to get that basketball product the way it is now to totally rebuild? That is not a normal NBA city, what they're doing there in Toronto. That's why I believe it's a bad move. Yeah, and, and, you, and you bring up a great point. Listen, I mean, the Boston Celtics with a healthy um, Kyrie, Kyrie Irving. Irving. And Gordon Hayward, maybe. The Toronto Raptors are not going to beat the Boston Celtics for some of the same reasons we just talked about. You're talking about a Boston Celtics team that is defensive-minded. Yep. Offensively, they really have no selfishness on that team. They move the basketball. They're playoff ready to me, and they're ready to take that next step. You have Philadelphia lurking in the wings. I don't think Toronto – beats either of those teams if they get to the conference wow. com, conference mm -hmm. final. Wow. I, I don't. Why would we think they would beat us? I'll tell you something. Oh, go Nick, ahead. Nick, the other thing is, as great a player as Kawhi Leonard is, to me, Kawhi Leonard is a manufactured player. This is not a he's guy. He's a product of the system. He's a product of the system, a product to his credit of his hard work, his work ethic. You know, he improved his skills. Mm -hmm. He shoots a jump shot. But – inherently naturally he's not like Kevin Durant right but sometimes listen sometimes you're a lump of clay and then an amazing sculptor turns you into David and then no matter where you go you're still David like so sometimes you're you're manufactured but the manufacturing process is over and now it's mobile I look at Toronto and I say this they won 59 games they just got better at their best player position and they can go for it for a season. They, uh, you're right. I understand top to bottom. Oh, Boston might have a better roster. They do. Philly might have a better roster. But what they won't have is the best player in a series. Toronto would have that. With I think they'd have that in every series against the East, except for Milwaukee. And people could argue Kawhi versus Giannis. Like, and, and so the reason that I think this makes perfect sense for Toronto is if you don't make a move, you're stuck in this purgatory because Boston has probably passed you as presently constituted. Philly's catching up. Milwaukee's on their way. And you've got DeRozan for the next three years. You got if, if, With this move, if Kawhi leaves, you can sell to your fans, we didn't want to rebuild, we went for it, he left, we tried to keep him. And now you have Lowry, Ibaka, and Valanciunas on expiring then deals. Then you still have the image back from Vince Carter, Tracy McGrady. Will a star from the United States, will he play basketball in Canada? So you, you have to realize now that that is a thought, all right? My brother coached there in Toronto. Keeping those guys there and bringing a star to Toronto is an issue. And here's oh, – sorry. Finish. No, go ahead. And here's a guy, like you said, who doesn't want to – who's made it very clear he doesn't even want to be there. So now you're starting a He wanted to go year. home and they're sending him out of the country. They're yeah. sending him as far <laughs> from home, basically, as you can get. But – but, Nick, and I hear you, maybe there's a valid reason and there's a reasonable argument to be had that you go for it for, for one year. But if I told you at the beginning of the year with an elite team, you make a trade with a high-level player who's now going to come to the team with a new coach, albeit he was an assistant there, mm -hmm. and now you have to mold this team surrounding an unhappy star who has been off-injured what are the chances of success that that team gets to the Eastern Conference Final? I'd have to think that a reasonable, you know, argument would be it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Throw away Philly, throw away Boston. I think the chances of hitting a home run for one year are very low, and that's why it's not a good move for them. The, oh, I mean, <laughs> I think that the Raptors, as presently constituted, reached their maximum potential. Right? We wouldn't know and that without LeBron being there. I don't think we can determine that. If LeBron hadn't been in the East and they had fallen after having a great regular season, which we thought, they utilized more bench players. They had changed their offense. They were playing I, better defense. Th 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 but LeBron has been their kryptonite. That, that's fair. And it, LeBron absolutely has been their kryptonite. But the point, we, we're doing a few things in the East I think we got to be careful about. Before Kyrie got hurt, the Raptors were ahead of Boston in the standings. Like, we do have to recognize that we did see the Raptors and Celtics for 60 games. Now, they didn't have Gordon Hayward. I understand that. But we saw them as they were, and Toronto and Boston were neck and neck. I think if you tell – if you remove – if the only year that exists in the NBA is next year, and then the league is going away, and you have the opportunity to swap out DeMar DeRozan and a bench piece, whether it's Siakam or OG Anunab Anuabi or whomever – for Kawhi Leonard, you do it. 
and you go for it. And if you have it, for, for, I also think for a franchise that's never been to the finals, the shot of getting to the finals is a real thing. And I'm not sure that Boston is the juggernaut yet because we've never seen them play together. We, and so let, I, it, I saw the Boston team without their two best players play against LeBron James. And they gave me enough confidence with those young stars because I saw Toronto as, con as constituted. Mm -hmm. I saw them play against the same team. One team had a real, real chance. Toronto did not have... So then why would you run it back is my question. If they didn't have a chance, why would you run it back? Why would you Toronto stick because the status the, quo? Because the beast is gone. It's easy. Listen, I, I, I think it's a question of what Toronto was building, all right? They made their major change in an effort to be different, and that is they switched out the their coach. coach. All right? So you're making a statement at that yeah. point. We had gotten to a point. We need a new voice. We're going to try to take this next leap with the assistant coach and Nick Nurse. All right? That's it. But you're going to do Nick Nurse and change out your best player for a guy that's coming to Toronto. And by the way, speaking of the Toronto thing, his check's going to be a lot lighter because of the taxes. Yep. Um, so you're not, you can now have an uh, unhappy player who has been injured and who's – you know, unhappy. Look, and winning a championship, it's a fine line. You know this. It's a fine line. You not only need the physical, but you need the mental. And now you've got your leader in the locker room, your best player, who has one, one foot in the water. And I'll make one argument against what I'm saying that you guys haven't mentioned. And that's DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry being best friends. Those guys do everything together. They do press conferences together. When Kyle Lowry used to be overweight, they used to walk to McDonald's in the middle of the night together and get McFlurries. Like, that is, we've seen DeMar DeRozan and his Instagram story talking about being lied to. We haven't heard yet how Kyle Lowry feels about this whole situation. It's still, a, it's still a chance I would take, but that is an X factor that I'm sure we'll hear more about once Kyle Lowry discusses Again, this deal not finalized yet, but definitely inching closer. Stu, we will see you a little bit later in the show. Coming up, though, what big name is going to be a no-show at Steelers training camp? Bet you could guess. Hey, Stu, Next you want to walk across the first. street and get a McFlurry? <laughs> because we no, that's a, new, no that's a nutrition problem. <laughs> yeah, like, we're we not playing no more. We can get a McFlurry. Really? McFlurry? <laughs> <laughs> Here on First Things First, it's about as deja vu as it gets, but here we go again. The Steelers have once again placed the franchise tag on Le'Veon Bell, and Le'Veon Bell will once again skip training camp. L. Bell's agent confirmed the three-time Pro Bowler will report before week one to sign his franchise tender. Bell turned down a five-year $70 million deal and will play on a one-year $14.5 million million dollar franchise tender this season. Cece, how big of a deal is it if Bell misses all of training camp? Well, it's, it's not a big deal because you expect him to miss training camp because he missed training camp last year. They franchised him again. I don't know why the club would expect him to do anything different. Now, the chances of him getting hurt, they're always real in football. But we watched Baltimore Ravens, first team to report to training camp today. All right, we got 50 days until the NFL season starts. Watch how many starters get hurt between now and the first game in practice. It's a real part of the National Football League. It's part of it. When you bring those 90 guys into training camp, guys are going to get banged up and guys are going to get hurt. So he removes that variable that he will be somewhat healthy the first game of the season. But as we saw last year, his overall productivity it suffered in the first three weeks of the season and then he finally got into football shape. It takes at least two to four games to get in the type of football conditioning. There is no gym. There are no exercises that get you ready to be involved in an NFL game where you're going to play 70 plays, 50 plays. You're going to run routes out of the backfield and you're going to touch the ball come giving it up the gut 15 to 18 times. So there is no gym. There is no magic pill. He will suffer from not being there because you can't get into that type of shape. But he will have the benefit of having done it last season. You guys know I follow the Pittsburgh media market a little closer than some others because some of my friends work there. And some of, there's local reporting going on there right now that says Mike Tomlin would be okay with if he signed his franchise tag with he would allow him to come into training camp and do not, nothing physical. Sit in on the meetings, be there, and that way he could at least be with the team, but it would remove the variable of injury. If that were to happen, 
How would the other players, like, is that a tenable situation? I would never want to be on a team where a player is not there practicing. The reason why you go to training camp, it's called a rarefied atmosphere that you're only going to be able to duplicate during training camp where you are practicing two and three times a day. You see your teammates being knocked down. You see overall muscle failure. You see the things that get you ready. And to have a veteran player, one of our best players there, sitting there watching me, watching me pass out and everything, no, that's not the way you put together okay, some football so, team. So th there would be that that's what I was that's what I thought you would say that there's th there that level of resentment doesn't exist. And if, if Mike Tomlin would even offer that you now you could start to see why sometimes this Pittsburgh team is disjointed. Why sometimes they got yeah. a mixed message. Why why is it like you, you, you go down Sean Payton, hey, man, can Drew Brees come to training camp and not practice? Sean Payton be like, H-E-L, no. Go to Belichick, no. Andy Reid, no. No other coach, none of the elite coaches in the league would be entertaining that type of deal. But so, but you're saying that resentment there, or potential resentment from other teammates, wouldn't, doesn't, isn't created by him not being there at all, by him being just totally out of the building. He doesn't have a contract. Okay. I mean, well. We respect that. He don't have a contract. The players respect that, and they know the business. They respect that more, him showing up the first week of the season, compared to me, I'm sitting here, and we all supposed to be doing the same thing, and he's sitting on his duff, and I'm sitting here working. That ain't going to go by on the NFL, man. That's not going to – players, football, high school, that wouldn't work. College, it wouldn't work. And I know it won't work in the end. Plus, NFL. Bell wouldn't go for that. Well, he listen, even I, if he signed, if he signed his tag and came, he wouldn't. I don't think he would want to do that. Well, listen, I, I I can't speak to what Le'Veon Bell would want to do. I just know that it was reported locally in Pittsburgh that Mike Tomlin would be open to that. That it would be better to have him in the building in some capacity than what it's going to be. And that's one of those things that, in a vacuum, makes sense. In a vacuum, before Chris explains exactly what he does, you would say, okay, would you rather have a guy with ideally he's there 100% full go, but if he's right now going to be at home, would you rather have him in the building even if he's not practicing? Sure, that something is better than nothing. What you're saying is that this is an instance where something would be way worse than nothing. With nothing, with him not signing the tag and not being there, he's not under contract technically. We get why he's not here. But if he signs the tag and everyone else has to go through those practices, then it would be different. Now, there is one other variable here that we saw happen in r relatively recently with an elite player. Our friend Josh Norman who was with Carolina a few years ago. And that is until he signed. The reason he doesn't sign the tag right now is then he has to show up. Because he's got a contract. They then have to, they can fine him $30,000 a day for not being there. So until he signs the franchise tag, he doesn't have to show up. The downside for him, the only potential downside not signing that franchise tag, aside from something horrific happening, car accident or something, is they could rescind the tag and say, you know what? You are now an unrestricted free agent. What, is that even on the board of possibilities for you? I don't think the Pittsburgh Steelers, they have shown an unbelievable level of class, of doing things, not for a week, not for a month, but since they've had the franchise. The Rooney family, I would be shocked unless some new information came outside of this as far as L. Bell doing something to make them upset. The Roonies have done things first class, and I do not. You would not put a franchise tag on a guy, take him to training camp, and then pull it away because you know teams are close to the cap and you are really hurting his ability to be able to move. Well, that's, I mean, that's why that I brought it up was if they, when we look at the running back market, and aside from Le'Veon Bell, no one's making even $8.5 million a year you could probably make, like, hey, if we pull the tag back, who out there this close to the season has the money to give him a long-term deal? Who out there could we pull the tag back and would his best offer be one year $10 million from us as opposed to one year 14 and a half? But you're saying it would undercut who they are as a franchise generationally. I mean, they're known for having class. Why all of a sudden would they start doing things totally out of their character. This is not going to help their football team. What they need to be concerned about, L. Bell needs to be concerned about, is we've seen the situation where players have filled in for him. D'Angelo Williams filled in for him when that he was beyond 30. Well. His, beyond his best days of playing, he was not in his prime, and he felt in. So we had Stu Jackson sit here and talk about Kawhi, which I don't believe he said is a product of the system. We could say L. Bell is a product of having Ben Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown because D'Angelo Williams in 12 times him filling in at a $2 million salary, which is a little bit above the, the veteran minimum, they were 77 
percent of the productivity that they got with L. Bell, they got from an aging, worn out running back. So when you talk about trying to sign a guy long term at running back, we have had too many examples of where they have been able to budget and spent a lot less money and almost got the same productivity. That, that exactly, that, that right there is an actual thing that happened, but that just anecdotally is the biggest problem for running backs getting paid, is the belief not that we can find another L. Bell, we can find another Zeke, but that we can find 75% of the production for 20% of the we money. We have seen the last 20 years guys not drafted, guys free agents, six-round picks. We have seen them come in the NFL and be stars immediately. We have seen that when your star running back leaves your team, we don't see the drop-off. That's the reason why the salaries, also the shorter careers and the injuries. How, how big of a deal is it when a guy, a big player like Le'Veon Bell, doesn't show up to training camp? I, I know this is what the Steelers do. It wouldn't be a normal Steelers offseason if they didn't have some sort of odd distraction or Facebook posting or training camp holdout. But does it affect the rhythm of the offense? Does it affect what they're doing? Does it affect, I mean, how? No, it creates another opportunity for another player. You know the guy's not there. He doesn't have a contract, so it doesn't affect the environment because we know only the guys signed are going to be here compared to a uh, guy signed and being here and a guy not working. We know if everyone's there, everyone's going to be working, and it presents another opportunity for someone to be able to make an impression on the Pittsburgh Steelers or show in the preseason that they're worthy of making an NFL roster, which they might not make the Pittsburgh Steelers, but they could show well and make another team. But he's not going to have to play catch-up in any regard. He's not going to have to take the first he will couple from a, He will games. from an endurance standpoint. He will from a getting in football but shape standpoint. The offense is the same. The, right. Yeah. Not They're from a, the same offense. They're athletically, the same he'll thing. be catching up. They have up. some new wrinkles. Right. Uh, you cannot get in the type of football shape. So that's the only catching up that he's going to do.